How's everyone doing? I've got the chat here, so we can uh, we can talk in case this is anyone's first time. Who whose first time is it? We seem to have a lot more people than usual. Got a good turnout today. Okay, some people are being shy today. That's okay. Well, we'll get to you. We'll get to you in a little while. So today the plan is we're gonna go through your normal startup process. We're gonna print some shirts. Gonna look at if there's any issues with the prints. We're gonna do a close up and show you what's going on, how to address it. And then we're gonna go through the shutdown process for, and your daily maintenance. So that's gonna be the plan for today. So let's just get right into it then since uh, everyone's being shy in the chat. So first thing you're gonna do, you wanna go ahead and turn on your printer, switch on the back and then from the control panel here, I've got mine already on on the control panel, so we're all set there. Once you've got the control panel on, if you have the plus, you're going to go ahead and circulate your white ink. Let that run for about 30 seconds and then turn it off. For all the people wearing headphones, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off because I imagine that's quite annoying. You guys get the picture. Uh, from there, we're going to go ahead and open your ink clips. You want to be real gentle with these. What I like to do, I like to put a finger behind and then pinch from the outside with my thumb. You don't want to go in between each ink tube. That'll put unnecessary pressure down on your dampers below. So you just go behind and open from the outside. And then you can move your clips up or down on the tubes so that you're not going to pinch it in the same place the following time you use it. If you put your your clips too high up on the line, they'll scrape the inside of the lid and give you this really horrendous noise. So you want to watch out for that. It's not really going to have that much of an effect on the actual function of the printer. It's very minimal resistance, but you will just hear a terrible screeching noise if you have the lid closed. So I recommend just keep them low while you're using the printer and then when you're shutting it down you can put them higher up on the tube if you need. So from there we need to do two head cleanings. We were just printing on this yesterday. If the printer's been idle for a couple of days, you do the two head cleanings, we're gonna print our nozzle check. And if your nozzle check doesn't look too great, then you're gonna to wanna to come back and do a prime on those ink lines that are looking a little iffy on the nozzle check. But we were just printing with this yesterday. I expect two head cleanings and the nozzle check's gonna be perfect. So that's gonna go through it while that's doing its head cleaning. Uh, I want to hear from the chat, how's everyone doing? Um, let, let's do a poll, let's see how long has everyone had their printers for? Alright, Michael's had his four years, Nat's had one year in December, okay, coming up on the year mark, that's cool. Two years from Julie. How, how do you find the importance of making sure you have uh, like spare parts on hand, like dampers, consumable parts, uh, the pump, stuff like that? Do you find that that's uh, quite valuable or is it largely inconsequential to just order it as needed? I, I want to have like the customer's opinion of it. You can unmute if you prefer, if it's easier. I, I know that might not be the, the easiest um, <laughs> to type out a whole, a whole response. Uh, you have to have it on hand. If not, then you're going to be down for days. Mm -hmm. And if you're printing every day, just can't afford to be down that long. Mm -hmm. I keep a print head, a pump, dampers, and a few other things on hand too. All the major stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's good to hear because I know it's one thing hearing it from, obviously the company has its own stance on you know, you, the, this is the optimal way to uh, operate the machine in the long term. But I think hearing from our customers as well kind of reinforces that that's kind of in the right vein. Um, so one, one thing that I don't know if you've taken advantage of over the years, but we do have that uh, free jet support kit. It does net you a little bit of savings with that. So it is good to, to have one of those on hand. It has most of the parts that you'll need except for the print head. It doesn't include that, but you'd get like $150 savings versus buying everything individually as needed. On top of like if you have to get like expedited shipping. I'm sure you've uh, learned with the expedited shipping to make sure you have everything on hand instead of paying hand over fist over for the 
for the shipping costs. Yeah, and we're on the East Coast, so. Oh, even worse. I, yeah, I make sure I have it on hand. Mm -hmm. That way I don't have to wait. All right, okay. Well, I really appreciate you chiming in there. I know I kind of put you on the spot. <laughs> Okay, so, so those two head cleanings are finished. Next thing I want to look at, um, I'm going to just rotate the machine here. We, we didn't really plan for this, but we have, um, uh, you can't really tell on the camera, we have the ink light blinking. For those who are newer to the equipment, the ink light blinking is the printer's way of saying, hey, I think my ink cartridge is running low. Uh, the printer doesn't use the ink cartridges anymore. We've replaced that with the bulk ink system. So it'll blink when it just thinks the, the levels are low in the driver. Uh, you can see the levels the printer thinks it has when you open up that Epson uh, R2400 driver uh, on that first page before you go to the maintenance tab. So uh, when those levels get low, you'll see the ink light flashing. You can just proceed like normal and it'll reset itself. Uh, the only exception is if you're trying to do a head cleaning from the control panel and uh, that head cleaning would use enough ink for it to run out, uh, it'll get stuck. In the case that it does get stuck, the head will be slightly offset from the capping station. You just tap the feeding button one time and it'll go ahead and complete that ink chip reset. Alternatively, if you do want to just reset it manually without having to wait for it to run into a problem uh, or you just don't want it to happen during a print or whatever the case may be, you can manually reset it with function and standby. You press it together and then the head's going to move over just a little bit, just like this. Maybe like a two finger gap there. And then you're going to hit function standby again. And it's going to go ahead and do that ink chip reset. Uh, like I said, it's not mandatory that you do this. The printer will take care of it automatically. Um, but in some cases, it's nice to just do it. So it's going to do that. Next, I'm going to go over to the computer. Uh, we've got it set up for screen shares today so you guys can see everything I'm doing on the on the computer here. So then we're going to go to devices and printers. Go to your Epson stylus photo R2400. If the if the Epson driver is grayed out on this screen, uh, you want to make sure that your USB cable is connected and the power light is on. If the control panel of the printer is not powered, then it's not going to show up here on the computer. So take a look at those. For some computers you want to make sure that you have the Epson printer set as the default but not for every computer. I'm not sure what the rhyme or reason is behind that but sometimes it helps. So what we're looking for right now is printing preferences. Here's those ink levels I was talking about. You go to the maintenance tab and then next we're going to do a nozzle check. So on the printer I've got my platen on here. I'm just going to do function rear. It's going to adjust the height. We're going to do nozzle check. I'm going to wait for it to uh, finish adjusting the height and then I'm going to print this nozzle check, make sure everything looks good before I start printing some shirts. Okay, here it goes. So what I want to do is compare what it prints to what's shown on the screen. If it looks more like the good picture than the bad picture, we're good to go. If it looks more like the bad picture, just like the little title implies, it's cleaning needed. The gantry came back to the front of the printer because I have it on the layer B setting. So I'm just going to hit standby and send it to the home position. So here I'm going to go ahead and examine my nozzle check. Are you still screen sharing? Oh, I believe I am still screen sharing. Give me one second. Stop share. Okay, I think you guys can see me on the big screen again. So I'm looking at my nozzle check. I've got the four channels of white and then the one of each color looking perfect, just like I was expecting. And you can just wipe that off with some super cleaner or some alcohol on a paper towel. Some people, they like to... Oh, that was very close up. I didn't even notice. So some people, they like to... Uh, Print, print the nozzle check onto like a transparency sheet. That's nice in some cases, but for our applications today, it's not really necessary. The benefit to doing that is you can kind of see if there's any trends in your nozzle check over the long term. 
and you can just like write the date next to each nozzle check uh, if that's something that you want to do. That's a little tedious for me. Um, I kind of just go day by day. So I've got my nozzle check here. Let's go ahead and load a shirt up. So we've got some pre-treated shirts. We're going to load it on here. Collar goes away from the ink bottles. You want to make sure you center it. You want the collar as close to the edge as you can get it without it sticking up. Ideally, you want no raised seams on the printing area. I like to center it. I'll tuck both sides at the same time, start from the center, and work my way to the sides. If you do one side to the other, you'll tend to get little ripples or bunching up in the corners. So I don't really like to take that approach. And in the close-up camera, I'm, I'm seeing that the shirt looks kind of dirty right here. It's not like that in, um, in person. I think that might just be the angle getting some dust highlighted. So I've got my shirt on here. I'm going to go ahead and do function and rear to adjust the height to this level. In the case that I have a print surface that's not perfectly flat like a normal t-shirt, let's say I'm printing on a polo or a shirt that has a, like a left chest pocket, you want to make sure that you manually adjust the height uh, to where it sticks up the highest if you can't put those seams over the edge. That's really important. So you would look at the sensors here on the front and you would basically line those sensors up with the part of the shirt that sticks up the highest. So we've got this all set. We're going to come back over to the computer now. So we've got our design here. We're going to do the little spooky skeleton for Halloween. I'm going to come over to environment. We've got a whole bunch installed on this one. We're going to go to the plus quality mode. And then you choose the environment based off of the garment that you're printing on. So in this case, we're printing on black cotton. And what you want to do is you want to judge the color of the shirt versus the colors in the design. So in this case, the black of the shirt is not close enough to the black in those eye sockets. So I'm going to treat it like dark cotton because I want it to print that black ink and I want to see that nice, rich eye socket blackness. So I'm going to do dark cotton. Another thing that I'm noticing here, uh, we've done our environment. We don't have the Q-RIP window open, so I need to go up to View and then Show Q-RIP. Another one I like to have open is View and then Channel Palette. This one will show me if I already have the choke set. So in the Q-RIP, I can adjust my size. So technically this size is okay. Your maximum print area on the adult platen is 12 and a half wide by 18 tall. Um, so this size is technically okay. Uh, let's go ahead and print it that size. If you wanted to adjust it, you could. You could just do it like this. As long as the, um, the little check mark is in this box with the lock, it'll, it'll keep its proportions. So it won't stretch it only in one direction and make the image look all funky. Um, so we'll leave that as is. We're going to do top center. That's going to center the graphic right underneath where the collar is. We're going to do print setup. We're going to choose the port. And one thing that I like to draw everyone's attention to is this little grid box looks a lot like this one, but they're totally different. So this guy right here, this is the position of the graphic on the platen. This is the position of the platen on the printing bed. So it, this is preset by our environments. So you never want to adjust this. Otherwise, everything can print like off center and looking all kind of funky. So we're going to leave that alone. We're going to go to properties and then we're going to do a two inch margin. That's my preference. Some people like 1.5, 1.75, but it's, that's kind of just personal preference. Uh, in the case, since we're already on this screen and I've got you, your guys' attention, in the case that you ever want to add more white ink, you would go to device options and you can change your resolution for the white underbase from 2880 to 1440. And so that will add a thicker white underbase, basically going to use like 50% more white ink for that underbase. The consequence of that is uh, it'll cost more since you're printing more ink, it'll take more time. 
and uh, you'll also have to cure it for an extra 90 second press in order to get optimal wash results. So keep that in mind if you do use that. For thicker garments or more textured uh, fabrics, you want to go ahead and change your dot size to either ML or L and that'll help the surface tension of the ink prevent the fibers from kind of sticking through as much. So keep that in mind. It doesn't apply to every job, but some jobs that can be handy if you didn't already know about that. So we'll click OK. Next thing that I want to look at is highlight. So that's going to be right up here. Um, the layout of this screen on this computer is kind of funny. Usually this stuff kind of is all in one line and this will be found towards the left side, but in my case it's top center. So for photos, you always want to turn highlight generator to none. Otherwise, like light reflections on skin don't end up printing properly. So put that highlight generator to none for photos. For areas where it's got like white text and stuff like that, highlight is really good. So you can leave that like that. Fuzziness can be set to 15 if it doesn't default to that in the environments that you have. I know for the 330TX environments, it'll default the fuzziness to 15. And then you want to change your highlight. Uh, 60 is almost, an, like, you won't even notice the difference in the ink volume. So you want to increase that 75 and to 85, and you'll see the difference. And then last step before we do a preview, we want to go to Image and Add White Underbase Choke. And what this is going to do is it's going to shrink the white underbase by two pixels as defined in this uh, highlighted area. So two pixels all the way around the edges so that you don't get that little um, white outline around your print. Then you're going to click OK. It's going to create the choke. Depending on your computer, this will be really quick or really slow and then it'll show up here in the channels. So you don't need to go ahead and uh, add multiples if you already have one applied. Then we can right click on the image, do a print preview. That's how it's going to look if it was a white shirt. This preview has no effect on the actual print itself. It's just for preview purposes. So you can make it whatever color background you want. But this is a good way to proof the, the print before you print it. Because if something's like going off the page or oriented funky, then you can go ahead and fix it before you commit to a print. So uh, it's ready to go. I can go ahead and hit print right here. Or if I want to make adjustments, I can exit with the little uh, door icon or the escape key. If I use the X in the corner, it'll close the whole program. So keep that in mind. Uh, I've made that mistake more than a couple of times. So we're going to go ahead and hit print. You can do copies. I recommend don't do any more than five copies at a time if you're going to do them. Uh, it just becomes difficult to manage. I would recommend just keep it one at a time, hit print when you're ready to go. Uh, if there's no adjustments you need to make to your job, just hitting print again is not going to take any more time, like just one second. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. All right, so while this print is going, uh, let's look at the chat. Any good tips for ensuring a straight and even t-shirt prior to printing? So what I like to do to straighten out the shirt when I'm loading it on the platen, uh, I'll pull the shirt by the armpit seams and then from the bottom where the platen ends and I'll center it against the, the blue edges of the printer or whatever edges are going to be even on both sides. So that's how I do that, Dallas. I know everyone kind of has their technique and that's the one that I employ the most. Anyone else have any questions, any input? Got any cool pictures of prints that you've been doing? Uh, Mario and Robert have a question. I have a question about printing all white with DTF. It looks great until pressed. Then it isn't as white. So in that case, the color of the garment may be showing through your white underbase and kind of making it look less bright. So that might be a case where you need to print a little bit more white ink. So in some cases, that'll mean you need to increase the resolution and then lower the underbase percentage and kind of find like a middle zone. Alternatively, you can, um, I'm not sure if the version of the DTF uh, environments that you have 
would let you increase it or if it's already defaulted to 100% at the 1440 resolution. Try increasing the percentage, like at the top of the direct rip, there's the under base percentage. If on your normal default settings, you can increase it, then that would be the way to go and increase it until you like the results. And alternatively, if it's just a white design and you're printing with the normal environment, the, the dark one, um, what you can do is increase the highlight uh, and that'll put more white ink as well. So give that a shot too. Let me know how that goes. My email's in the, in the chat, so uh, send me some pictures when, when you try those out. Hampton asks, how long do spare parts last before they go bad, like print head and capping station? Real quick before I read the rest of that, do you mean like, like before you install it or once you've installed it and you're using it, how long you expect it to last? Or how long they would last on like a shelf? And then the rest of the question is also, can you email the different color strengths for different materials? I only print on white cotton, but I want to do more. So color strength, for the most part, I don't really adjust it at all. On the dark garments, the main adjustment is gonna be to the white underbase. It's not that common that you would adjust the color strength on anything other than white garments as spare waiting to be used. As long as you have the spare parts stored uh, nicely, like they're not getting in like direct sunlight. Uh, if you leave it in its original packaging, then it should be fine indefinitely until you use it. But if you have it just like sitting out on the countertop collecting dust, you might have issues when you go to use it. I also have been having issues printing a Tiffany blue or like a teal. It always tends to come out as baby blue. Uh, any recommendations on getting a teal? So I would have you take a look at the graphic. If the color format is RGB, try changing it to CMYK and see if it prints any differently for you. And if it's already in CMYK, try RGB. Um, the, the way that the printer converts true CMYK to the CMYK uh, color profiles that we have with the gamma inks. Sometimes it'll interpret it differently than what's shown on the screen. So trying it both ways may help. Alternatively, that may be a color strength or white underbase issue. So you wanna check those out as well. Send me pictures of that, please. All right. So this one's almost done. Um, one thing that I did want to also talk about, one other thing that I wanted to draw your guys' attention to is uh, calculating your ink cost. So you wanna go to options and then ink cost, and then you put your cost per liter here. So this one's actually pricing out to the, um, the direct inks in the liter volume. So I'm gonna change this to reflect the gamma ink prices. And then we update. And then once this print is done, we can see how much this uh, whole print cost. All right. Okay, so we can go into the queue manager Click the little plus sign once the print is done. And then if we scroll down a smidge, come on, let me scroll. So this, this print uh, costs $2.50. This is our, our result. Let me get in real close here so I can show you everything going on. Oop, it's gonna be blurry. All right, so white underbase ended up looking pretty good. Really the only gripe that I have about this particular print, uh, there's a little bit of pre-treat inconsistency here in the E, and that's really about it. The rest of the print ended up looking really nice. Even with the white underbase, I didn't see anything that drew my attention. The little award here, you can tell this is a really old version of this design because it's only got our 2016 award since then we've gotten an award every year so uh quite old and then even our color wheel the registration is looking really nice 
Typically, if the registration is off a little bit, you'll really notice it in this color wheel. Um, even when we choked the white underbase, the uh, Omniprint text still turned out really nice as well. Sometimes with really fine white text, when you add the white underbase choke, it'll kind of remove the white underbase and make it disappear. And that doesn't seem to have happened in this case. So ultimately, I'd say this is a very good print. I'm very happy with it. And even the pre-treat job was quite good. You can barely tell that there's a, a pre-treat square. Uh, so what I would want to do at this point is run through the shutdown process. So I'm going to set this to the side and we'll go ahead and go through shutdown. Is there anything else printing related that uh, anyone has questions about? What about printing on sweatshirts? Do you need to change the heat settings or any print settings? So the main change with sweatshirt is if it's the one that has the pouch, you want to load it sideways so that the sleeves will go over the edge and the pouch can go over the edge if it's large enough for that. So you want all those seams over the edge and tucking it in sideways can help with that. Alternatively, there's a zipper hoodie platen or um, some of the smaller platens will also allow you to get that print without having to deal with the seams. Um, that's going to be the biggest challenge with those thicker garments because they'll typically have thicker seams. And even if you would manually adjust the height to those seams and set the, the computer to uh, unidirectional so that you can ac account for the increased distance of the head, it still won't be close enough and you'll get a blurry print. That's going to be the biggest challenge. Uh, you typically do need a little bit more pre-treat on those garments because uh, they're a little bit more absorbent. Subsequently, you also need to dry them more thoroughly for the same reason. They'll retain the moisture and then when you print, you're going to have that like pinhole effect. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen that if you didn't dry your garments well enough. But as far as like temperature or settings in the direct rip, the only other thing that I would recommend is a large dot size on the white underbase. And that'll help with that surface tension like what I said before. Since we're done with the print, we're going to go ahead and go through a, a shutdown process. So first step, I like to always lower the print table all the way down. I think that's a really nice practice so that even if you know you come back to it and you haven't had your coffee yet, you forget to adjust the table height, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a blurry print rather than a head strike. So that's a really important step. It's not really something that I think is talked about enough. Uh, so I'm going to try and talk about it and get it added into as much stuff as I can because I think that's a valuable addition to that. Next, we're going to go ahead and clip the lines. So you can move the clips up or down just so that you're not pinching those uh, lines in the same place. Some of the documentation will have you do this at the end. The order that you do the clipping of the lines doesn't really matter that much. Okay, I think we're going to get the close-in shot here. Okay, so we're going to do function and up to undock the print head. Let's see if we can see the capping station. we got to adjust a little bit down. All right, so I'm going to get one of the swabs and some super cleaner. Now, I think I've talked about this before, but it's a really good idea to actually pick up the swabs from us. Uh, they do tend to be kind of a higher quality than the, like, 99 cent for a dozen or whatever you get on Amazon. Um, those ones that I find that the little foam caps on the end come off and it's just a kind of a pain. They bend really easily. Uh, weirdly enough, the ones that we carry are, are worth it. Um, I would expect that these would be kind of generic, same quality across the board, but I do like these better than uh, other ones that we've used. Okay, so we're going to unclip the cleaner clip and use that little primer bulb to pump the cleaning solution into the capping station. And you can see until it mixes together like that, but not enough that it overflows. So having it regularly overflow can have negative effects on your pump and it can go, your pump can go out faster. Because right there at the bottom, I'm sure those of you who have done pump replacements know, the bottom of the pump has all those gears. And so if those gears have a bunch of ink buildup, so basically 
you want to fill it up so that it mixes but not overflows. Then you're going to press the little plunger and drain the capping station until you hear the little hissing noise of the air escaping. Don't know if the, the, if the microphone picked that up, but it made the noise. Repeat. And you want to repeat it two or three times until basically the cleaning solution is clear enough that you can see the little, uh, the little like wire on the capping station. There we go. Ooh, extreme close up. Okay. I'm going to do it one more time and this time I'm going to use the cleaning solution in the capping station to clean it. So I'm going to take the swab and I'm going to clean the edges around the capping station. So as you can see there's a fair amount of buildup. Last person to clean this didn't do that great of a job. Mauricio. Okay, and the most important area to focus on is going to be that top edge of the black plastic rim that would dock with the print head. If that area is dirty, the print head won't be able to make a clean seal with the pump, so your head cleanings and priming will be less effective. And so the same thing kind of applies to the underside of the print head where when you clean the area around the uh, nozzle plate that area has the same reason that we clean it so that it can make a nice uh, seal with the capping station and get nice and clean then we're going to clean the wiper blade here if you have enough buildup on there uh, it may be worthwhile to uh, get your dip your swab in some super nozzle cleaner apply some super nozzle cleaner over all this area and then let it sit for a minute or two and then come back with a dry swab and go with a dry swab for some extra uh, like scrubbing power basically and sometimes that ink will just kind of melt off from the super nozzle cleaner so next time you have a nice dirty capping station give that a shot and then email me if, uh, if that works out for you. I want to hear your feedback. Okay. Ultimately, we're looking pretty clean here. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. I don't want to you know, keep you guys for too long. So we're going to go ahead and uh, call it clean. I'll probably spend another couple of minutes after the after the live show kind of cleaning it up. Sometimes it gets to a point where you want to use maybe some tweezers or something to get that stubborn little strip of ink that just won't come off with the swab and that's okay. As long as you're careful you're not going to uh, damage the parts at all then it should be fine. Uh, here's our janky uh, camera set up there in the frame. Give you a little behind the scenes. Um, so now what we want to do is open the clip and top off that cleaning solution in the capping station just barely until it mixes together again not enough for it to overflow excessive overflow can shorten the lifetime of your pump so keep that in mind that's really important then you're going to hit function and dock the print head back into that cleaning solution You can go ahead and close the lid and then you can turn the printer off with the switch on the back. If you're a 330TX user, that's the end of it. If you're a 330TX Plus user, you want to turn it on one last time so that that base power is on and the circulation system can go ahead and run regularly uh, while the printer is idle. So that's that's the startup to shut down. Does anyone else have any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, how do you avoid pre-treat staining on polyester? So polyester tends to be a lot more delicate in the realm of pre-treat. So you need to ride that line between 
uh, not enough and too much pre-treat. Uh, so if you're having staining, back it up. Back it up on the pre-treat volume. If that doesn't really help, like if you can't get it to a low enough pre-treat volume that it doesn't stain, then the issue might be elsewhere. You want to take a look at your temperature. So you would try maybe pressing it in shorter intervals. So maybe try 10 second presses consecutively until it's dry, or you can do uh, five second presses until it's dry. Um, ultimately, uh, it's either the time, the pressure, or the amount of pretreat that'll contribute to that staining. So that's a great question. I'm sure a lot of people have that same question. Thank you, Ray. How much free jet grease do you use? Seems like no matter how much I use, I get squeaking while printing. So keep in mind when you take the grease off, you don't want to use any degreaser or any chemicals to remove the grease. Uh, you're just wiping it off and when you're putting it back on there, you want to make sure you put grease back on the top and the bottom of the bar. That way it's got complete coverage and you're not gonna get that squeaking. So if you are putting it there, maybe try the front and back of the bar. There's gotta be some area of the bar that's not getting sufficiently greased. So check those other areas. It's not just the top of the bar that needs the grease. I like to do nozzle check to make sure that it is firing okay. A print might look good, but color might be dropping out a little. If so, I want to fix it before shutting it down. So that's entirely correct. So that's why we did the nozzle check here uh, at the very beginning. If there's anything that looks off about the print, then you would do another nozzle check and compare uh, to how it looked before. Because if, if one of your nozzles is dropping out very quickly um, when you're using the printer, there may be an issue with uh, a part or ink flow or something like that. So maybe your damper, dampers are kind of the common suspect because they're a little bit delicate or you might be running out of ink in that channel. There's a variety of things that may contribute to that. So, so that's, that's really good input Hampton, thank you. So I think, let's see, Dallas has one. Canon has a question. Does DMing me instead of the panel? Question is, if you have a white image only, how do you drop more white? So when I was screen sharing on the laptop, it would be on the, um, in the QRIP window, you go to the printing preferences, I'm sorry, printing preferences, print setup. You do properties uh, in the top right of that window. And then you wanna go to device options. And from there, you can um, increase the resolution of the white underbase. And from there, if you click OK back to the main screen, more than likely you should reduce the overall underbase percentage that's at the top of the page and maybe reduce that a couple of percent. That's also a very good question. That's a very common one. Thank you for asking. All right, is there anything else, anybody? If not, we're gonna go ahead and, and end it here. Uh, thank you everybody for the for the input in the chat. That's always appreciated. If you guys have any other questions, go ahead and email us. Email me brian at omniprintonline.com. Hit us up on the Facebook page. Is it possible for us to drop a link to the Facebook group? And just as a just as a reminder, guys, you do have to be trained and certified to join the Facebook group. So if someone watching is not certified by us, then we gotta get you certified before we get you in the Facebook group. Uh, so let me know if you need help coordinating that. Thank you, everybody, and, and have a nice day.